I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut, to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op, REI believes a life outside is fundamental to a life well lived. Visit NewEngland.com and Camping World. There's a sense of satisfaction and pride that comes with building your own boat, as my son Max and I did a few years ago. Our humble 16-foot work skiff isn't the prettiest vessel afloat, but it's rugged, stable, and roomy as well as easy to trailer. All of these attributes came to bear when Max and I traveled to East Haddam, Connecticut for a paddling and camping adventure on the Lower Connecticut River. At the town landing just below the historic Swing Bridge and Goodspeed Opera House, I met up with Andy Fisk, Executive Director of the Connecticut River Conservancy whose mission is to protect and enhance New England's longest river. After launching Andy's canoe, we set a course for the entrance to Chapman Pond, about a mile downstream. Oddly enough, this stretch of the Connecticut remains tidal, so the water levels change despite the fact that it's clearly a freshwater environment, home to largemouth bass, catfish, and carp, as well as several anadromous species. Our work is about making the Connecticut River clean, healthy and full of life. And so that full of life part, you know, whether you got fins or flippers or wings or pinchers or hands and feet. Why are lamprey your favorite uh, uh, Connecticut River species? And I think that all of the migratory fish play an incredibly important ecological role. I like them because um, they need some extra love. And people tend to think about a lamprey as really um, uh, offensive or scary but they play an important role and they're native to our uh, river systems. So what are some of the benefits of a lamprey? So a lamprey, like the other migratory species, actually is critical to our freshwater ecosystems way up in the watershed. So our ecosystems have actually evolved to rely on the nutrients in the bodies of these migratory fish. And so they're living in the ocean, like a lamprey or a shad or a herring, and when they die after spawning in the upper watershed, they release their nutrients. And those nutrients are critical to those um, upper freshwater ecosystems. After paddling for about 30 minutes, Andy and I came to the narrow inlet leading to Chapman Pond, which is home to one of the many campsites that make up the Connecticut River Paddler's Trail. The trail stretches the entire 410 mile length of the river from the Canadian border all the way to Long Island Sound. So the Paddler's Trail was a logical opportunity to be able to build out infrastructure for people that want to take you know, a short trip or to do the whole epic 410 miles. So we're one of the many partners that make this successful. It's a really awesome collaborative uh, endeavor. Appalachian Mountain Club has done a tremendous work to be able to get the um, campsite infrastructure built and they work with us and other partners to identify sites. AMC members have been paddling on the Connecticut River or its tributaries for over a hundred years. So it's been really neat to work on encouraging more people to paddle on the Connecticut River, knowing our long history with getting people out on the Connecticut River and its tributaries. So one of the things I've loved about paddling on the Connecticut River is the amount of eagles, and we've all been reading about how the eagles have really made a comeback. And the beauty of being in a boat is that you're really quiet and you can look at wildlife in a way that you wouldn't be able to, that might be a little bit louder. Really, there's nothing better than that. We have a 
Wow, this place is really hidden here, Andy. That's I mean, right. you wouldn't really know you wouldn't know about it from the entrance to the creek. That's what makes some of these campsites special. We love to have people visit them, but yeah, you don't want to have a big billboard here because when you get here, it's a really special place. Yeah. So, take a little bit of work to get here. That wasn't too bad. That was a, that was a nice jaunt. Well, you had the you you had the you were the major source of source of propulsion. So, I can't take any credit. You're a good paddling partner. <laughs> The Chapman Pond campsite is part of the 700-acre Chapman Pond Preserve, jointly managed by the Nature Conservancy and the East Haddam Land Trust. The site features two wooden platforms and a moldering toilet. Open fires are not allowed, but propane stoves can be used for cooking. Campers will also need to bring their own drinking water. Our job is to do um, good work all throughout the watershed for everybody that lives here. And so it's incredibly important to be able to have a healthy ecosystem. And uh, when you bring back ecological abundance, you create a whole lot of run on opportunities. So more fish means more recreational opportunities. More fish means healthier watersheds and healthier forests, it means healthier communities. And so we really feel like you, uh, you got to touch on all parts of the work. It's not just about doing one thing. It's about helping everybody that lives in this watershed, regardless of whether they're human uh, or, or otherwise. The more access we can provide, whether it's an urban community, rural, suburban, people connect to their river. Because what's important, who owns our rivers? All of us. The public owns the rivers, and they need to understand that it's their river and they have a role to say, this is what I want for it. It's my river, I'm a steward of it, and this is my expectation for it. And so the more people you get on it, you have transformative experiences. You've been there, you know, you know what it's like to be in a beautiful spot in the morning or the evening, you know, it, it heals your soul. And that's incredibly important to inspire people to do the work that needs to be done. Because if you can't see and live and be on your river, you're not gonna care about it. Shortly after Andy paddled back upstream to the launch area, Max arrived in the skiff laden with our camping supplies. Although the Chapman Pond campsite is restricted to non-motorized vessels, we had received a special allowance for the sake of filming. After setting up our camp, Max and I took the skiff a few miles farther downriver to the entrance of Selden Creek which flows behind Selden Neck State Park. The 604-acre Selden Neck, actually an island since the 1850s, is managed by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Affairs and features four boat camping sites and hiking trails leading to a former farmstead and the remains of a granite quarry. The next morning, Max and I woke early to break camp, make breakfast, and wander part of the loop trail that winds through the Chapman Pond Preserve. The property features a mix of mature oak and hemlock forest interspersed by patches of mountain laurel. A small stream flows through a ravine and into the pond. It's a beautiful spot, but there were more of those in store as my Connecticut River adventures continued farther downstream. A few weeks after my camping trip at Chapman Pond, I was back on the Connecticut, this time in Old Lyme, near the mouth of the mighty river. At the Old Lyme Town Landing, I met with Scott Schneider and Matt Stone, a couple of avid kayak fishermen who work at Black Hall Outfitters. Matt and Scott were kind enough to set me up in a new Old Town Autopilot 120, powered by a Minn Kota electric motor. The motor moves the kayak along at a good clip, even against a stiff current, and is controlled by a remote. Plus, its spot lock feature uses a built-in GPS receiver to hold the kayak in a chosen location, as if it were anchored. Initially, it felt like cheating, but I soon got over that. With the morning sky beginning to lighten, we headed out onto the main branch of the river, 
and it wasn't long before we encountered striped bass attacking Menhaden on the surface. These fish were hungry, and Matt immediately hooked up. Thanks in large part to the foggy conditions, the stripers continued to feed well throughout the incoming tide. Since their prey of the day was adult menhaden, also known as bunker or pogies, big topwater plugs proved very effective. This type of fishing is about as exciting as it gets, especially when a huge striper suddenly wallops your lure a few feet from the kayak. Whether you can land the fish or not is another matter. The Old Town kayaks Scott, Matt, and I were using are rugged, super stable platforms that can be equipped with electronics, bait wells, and no end of gadgets. Plus, it can be easily transported on the roof of a car or in the bed of a pickup, and can be used to fish in areas that are too shallow for an outboard powered boat. Oh, hold on. Oh, there he goes. Perfect. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, so Matt. Tell me about this, this this fishery on the Connecticut. Like, when does it when, when does it typically start? Uh, kind of late late spring. Um, the fish will start moving in um, from offshore. Typically, we get a couple of different pushes of fish. Um, sometimes we'll get the Hudson fish, and then we'll get fish that come around from the Chesapeake around Montauk and things like that. It's really kind of impossible to truly tell where they came from, but right. we do typically get multiple pushes of fish up into the river. Um, over the course of a few weeks. Uh -huh. And when does it last until? Uh, kind of till the water warms up. It depends on the temperature of the water. Um, as we saw today, they're up there chasing bunker. Um, when those kind of move out a little bit, um, or when the water gets uncomfortable for them temperature-wise, they'll start to move out to reefs offshore. Okay, gotcha, right. <laughs> and uh, you got lots of bunker in the, in the river right now, We right? do, yeah, yeah. There's actually not as much this year as there was last year. But depending on where you are, there can be football field sized schools of bunker. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's incredible. We get um, in the spring, this is a pretty consistent bite. Um, we'll, we'll wait. It's one of the first big, exciting bites of the year. Um, kind of kicks off the, the summer season. Uh, happens right around now when school's starting to get out, people are starting to get to their summer homes. And um, it's a lot of fun. It's also, you know, ease of access. Um, we have 40 plus inch stripers, you know. 10 yards offshore or a two minute paddle from a boat launch. And that's just not the case a lot of times in the year. So this is a really fun bite. And it's a um, special, yeah, it's a, and it's a great way to kick off the season. Very much <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you, those those fish today, are they're fun sized, they're they're acrobatic, they're spunky, they're full of bunker, and healthy the, fish. And they'll hit a topwater plug. And they'll hit a topwater <laughs> plug, yes, they will. Yeah, there's really <laughs> nothing like seeing a, a big bass just crush a topwater lure, right? Yeah, that pop is a special kind of noise that gets your heart going. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I got into fishing from my dad. Uh, he, I have two little brothers and he would take my brothers and I fishing. Um, he had a dream to have a bass boat, which he did. Uh, and I grew up in, in Vermont, so we would spend a lot of summers on the bass boat. And uh, soon after that, I jumped in the kayak when I was about 15 and started fishing small ponds. and. Since then, the sport has grown and, and it's been fun to grow with it. One of the challenges of saltwater versus fresh is definitely tides. Uh, you know, it can really be like a light switch. Turn them on, turn them off, relocate them. Uh, it's a little bit of a guessing game. Uh, we also get a lot of different species here in the saltwater, which is a lot of fun. Uh, in, in freshwater, if you're going for largemouth bass, most of the time you're going to catch largemouth bass, maybe a smallmouth, um, but here, there are days where you can catch a half dozen species of sport fish in one trip right off our shores. The Old Lime area is really paddle friendly. Uh, we have a lot of saltwater estuaries, we have a lot of rivers with feeder creeks. Uh, it's a really good place if you've never spent time uh, in a canoe, in a kayak, on a stand-up paddle board. Um, you can go by Black Hall Outfitters in Westbrook or Old Lime and uh, it's very easy to learn and appreciate um, this hobby. Kayak fishing, uh, for me, that's part of the appeal, is uh, I like fishing from boats, 
but when I hook a fish in a boat, I always feel like I have the upper hand. You know, I have a buddy who can hold a net for me or um, I can move around the boat as needed. When you're in the kayak, uh, as we saw today, you know, you're right up close and personal. Um, it's, it's eye to eye with those fish. Uh, you're six inches from the water level, depending and uh, it's much more evenly matched for me, which just you know, makes it more sporting and, uh, and a lot more fun. Serving as the kayak fishing headquarters in this part of Connecticut is Black Hall Outfitters, with locations in Old Lyme and Westbrook. Owned and operated by Gene and Audra Shamil, Black Hall also sells fishing tackle, water sports apparel, and other gear, and rents kayaks and paddle boards. Black Hole Outfitters, you know, has a couple of different components to our business. One of them is all the things that we do on water. Um, whether it's a DIY rental, we, we've got a fleet of boats that, you know, we can put 100 people on the water at any given time. We do lessons, we do sunset paddle tours, we do eco tours, uh, and we also uh, do a kids camp uh, for th uh, three hours a day, two sessions a day. We get a bunch of kids down here. We get them in the water. We teach them the basics of paddling. They get to paddleboard. They get to kayak. They learn technique. Um, they do scavenger hunts. They do treasure hunts out on the island. We've got some really amazing uh, estuary out here. Um, the one thing that we really feel is kind of a, a major point of difference for Black Hall is that because we're located directly on wildlife preserves, there's no heavy boat traffic. It's uh, shallow, protected ecosystems, kind of like the Everglades. It's a national park, and we don't have to worry about crazy boaters and lots of traffic. So it's really, it sets up well for all of our paddling activities, but especially for the kids' camp. It gets them in the water and paddling in a safe environment. BHO's old Lime location is ideally situated on the Black Hall River putting it within easy paddling distance of the Connecticut River mouth and the meandering tidal creeks of the Great Island Wildlife Area and Roger Torrey Peterson Natural Area Preserve. I had long wanted to explore this wild coastal expanse of the Lower Connecticut River, and I would get my chance, thanks to a very interesting woman. Eco-tour guide and former elementary school teacher Sharon Baldy spent a lot of time on the Connecticut River as a kid growing up in Old Saybrook. She has a deep and enduring passion for the water, which quickly became apparent when I joined her for a paddle to Great Island starting at Black Hall Outfitters in Old Lyme. Great Island teems with bird life through much of the year. The marsh is forested by osprey nesting platforms, while numerous wading birds stalk the grassy banks. Tree and barn swallows, as well as terns, dart and dip over the water. Small wonder the famed naturalist and illustrator Roger Torrey Peterson eventually settled in Old Lyme. When Peterson died in 1996, a portion of his ashes were scattered over Great Island Preserve, which now bears his name. Birders who wish to access the marsh in small craft can launch at the Great Island Boat Launch in Old Lyme, which also features an observation platform overlooking the marshes. This whole expanse of marsh to our right, is that, that's the Great Island Preserve? Well, the Great Island Preserve is right quarters of the Connecticut River. This is just um, the Back River, which is just an estuary that comes out of the Connecticut River. And so the mount, the river is right over there. Of course, you know, the river is 410 miles. So that's the actual mouth. So you've got, this will turn into brackish water about a half a mile up. So the species that you're gonna have with the fresh water and the salt water, you have different species. You'll have some oyster catchers down here. You have some turns. And then as soon as you start to go up, it starts to get brackish. So then you're gonna get a whole different species of things. Every time I come out, it's a different day, it's a different experience, and what I see is different, what I feel is different. Um, it, what I, I look for is different, and uh, my goal that day is different, and I try to communicate that to the clients I take out. I don't go the same route every time. I go with what I feel they would like, or what um, is, what nature is, is 
pushing me to do, maybe inland or maybe go out where there's more waves. So I really try to stay motivated in my work because I don't do the exact same um, trip every single time. I vary it. So right here it'll start to get a little choppy because now we're getting out to the point of where the Connecticut River is. Yep. And you've got a lot of water that's now coming, the tide's coming in. Um, it can be very dangerous in certain tides. Oh yeah? Um, yeah. Um, something you really got to be careful for. Um, it, can, it can move really fast and because the water, fresh and salt water is mixing, it swirls and does kind of strange things. And we've got all these sandbars, so you've got waves, tides, and then you have tides moving different directions and it gets a little swirly. So we get other, we get very interesting things in here, like sand sharks. Sand sharks? I saw a couple sand sharks in here, which was interesting. What, now, how did you see them? Their fins? They came right up next to me. No way. And it was September in this creek. And Are you serious? With not much water. Wow. Yeah, is that? Did that freak you out a little bit? <laughs> well, you know, you just never know what you're gonna see when you come out here. I mean, it's one of those things, if you spend enough time somewhere. That's true. You're, you're, you're gonna happen upon something. So as I grew up, um, coming home from college, as soon as I saw the river, I was home. I never left and I settled here. Um, I settled in Old Saber. My house is right by the river and I still paddle the places that dad and I used to go crabbing and I look up in the sky and I just say, dad, I'm here. I'm still here after all these years and um, there's such power in that and I, I consider myself extremely um, blessed. Thank you.